We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We send blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his entire household and all his companions. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless every single one of them. And may he bless every single one of us and our offspring, those to come up to the last day. Ameen. My brothers and sisters, Zaid was a common name amongst the companions of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. One of them was Zayd ibn Harithah radiyallahu an, whom we will be speaking about tomorrow inshallah, if Allah gives us the opportunity to do that. This evening we want to start with another Zayd who was known as Zayd ibn Thabit radiyallahu an. He was from al Madinah al munawwara and he was from amongst the Ansar. He was approximately 11 or 12 years old when Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made the hijrah to Medina Munawwara and he had accepted Islam being an orphan with the rest of his family on that particular day and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made a dua for him. So he was a young boy age of approximately 11 when he accepted Islam and he had gone with his family to see Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when he had come to Medina Munawwara just after the Hijrah and this is when he accepted Islam. Zayd ibn Thabit ibn al-Dahak al-Ansari radiyallahu anhu. May Allah's peace and blessings be upon him. He was a person whom Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made a dua of goodness for as he accepted Islam and he was quite young. So a few years later, approximately two years later, the battle of Badr took place. So Zayd ibn Thabit as a young boy decided to come with his sword and as some of the other Sahaba did as well who were of his age they came and they wanted to take part and go out with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam but Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was very strict when it came to ensuring that those who were under age do not take part so he looked at Zayd ibn Thabit al-Ansari radiallahu an and because he was only very young at the time he told him you cannot participate with us and Zayd ibn Thabit was quite sad in fact he cried and his mother was also quite saddened because he's, he could not participate in that particular battle and that was the battle of Badr. The same happened at the battle of Uhud. But this did not deter them from serving Islam in a different way. So he spoke to his mother. He says, Oh my mother, I want to serve Islam and I want to serve it in a big way. So the mother says, why don't you start learning things? Why don't you start memorizing as much of the Quran as you can and you start learning so when Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam returned, they went to meet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his mother told Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, this son of mine Zayd ibn Thabit radiallahu an, he writes very well and he reads as one of the better of those who read. So he reads and writes very well and he has memorized 17 surahs of the Quran already, subhanallah. And he was quite young. And he reads very well, just like you would read, O Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as though the Quran is descending, meaning powerful recitation. So Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam decided to test him, subhanallah. And the young boy read, and he read from a few places in the Quran, and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam found him to be even better than the description that the mother and the others had actually made of him. This was Zayd ibn Thabit radiallahu anhu. So Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked him, O oh Zayd, and he was a young boy, I want you to learn the Hebrew language. Zayd ibn Thabit, I want you to learn the Hebrew language because we have communication with those who speak Hebrew from amongst the Jews and so on. We need someone trustworthy who knows and who knows that we will not be cheated or conned and nobody would misinterpret what they have written and what we have written and so on. So do you know what happened? Something surprising. Two weeks later, the young boy comes back. How long later? 15 days. He comes back. He says, Oh Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I have learned Hebrew and I have mastered it completely. I know every aspect of the language. So he could write it. He could read it. He could speak it. He could understand it. And he could communicate very well in it. Subhanallah. What a gift. Blessed Sahabi. Granted a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by the dua of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He went to learn a language and 15 days later he comes back and he knows it completely thoroughly inside out, upside down. Subhanallah. 
So Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to use him to write the letters. And then Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, there is another language that I want you to learn. It is the language known as Syrianiya, Syriac. Allahu Akbar. It is a dialect of Aramaic. He came back 17 days later and he said, Oh Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I've mastered that language too. Amazing. And Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Man ta'allama lughata qawmin amina sharrahum. Whoever learns the language of people will be protected from any harm that is intended against them by people of that language. You know, sometimes we go somewhere and in Malaysia, what happens is people look very different. You have different colors and sizes and shapes and everything else. So when you walk in and people think you're a foreigner and a stranger and they start speaking in your language without knowing you actually know the language and they say so many things about you and on your way out, you just greet them and say one or two words and they go as red as tomatoes. Have you noticed that? Subhanallah. It has happened with me where people do not believe you come from Zimbabwe. So they start speaking in the Shona language, not realizing that, hey, you know what? I speak the same language, Subhanallah. And after a while, they, they are shocked out of their, Subhanallah, skins. May Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala use us to learn languages. Brothers and sisters, remember, learn as many languages as you can. With us sometimes at school, we learn the French language, for example. But we learn it for four years. And when we come back, the most we can say is comment ça va, ça va bien, and that's it. And that's four years you studied it and you have a certificate in, in French. Come on, can't you speak? These were the companions of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Learning languages is some of the teaching of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He taught his companions. Here is Zayd ibn Thabit ibn al-Dahaq radiyallahu an. And this was the power that Allah had blessed him with. So Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam chose him to write revelation. When Jibreel alayhi salam after that used to come to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam with revelation, he used to call Zayd ibn Thabit, Oh Zayd, come and write down what Jibreel alayhi salam has come with. And he used to write them on various skins and, and different types of uh, paper and skins and parchments that they used to write on that they had at the time. So this was Zayd ibn Thabit al-Ansari radiallahu an, also known as Katibu Wahyi Rasulillah sallallahu alayhi sallam, person who used to write revelation of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam or of the Quran that used to come to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Then on the day of Tabuk, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam gave him one of the flags of the Muslimin. So as young as he was, he participated in the battle of Tabuk and he participated also in Khandaq and various other battles. When Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu was being appointed as a Khalifa after Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, there was a discussion that happened between the Ansar and the Muhajireen as the Ansar, the people of Medina wanted to appoint Sa'd ibn Ubadah radiallahu anhu. So Zayd ibn Thabit radiallahu anhu was the first from amongst the Ansar or one of the first from amongst the Ansar who stretched his hand and pledged allegiance to Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu because he said, Oh my people, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was a Muhajir. So we keep the Khilafah in the Muhajireen. And we are the Ansar and the helpers and we will help the Khalifa. Here is Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu an, and I pledge my allegiance to him. Amazing. This was Zayd ibn Thabit ibn al-Dahaq al-Ansari radiallahu an. Also at the time of Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu an, and the time of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu an, we spoke about how the Quran was brought together and how at the time of Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu, they used only one manuscript and they used only one type of writing, one dialect. The man responsible for doing all this was Zayd ibn Thabit al-Ansari, one of the top reciters of the Quran at the time of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. Whenever you pick up the Quran that you have nowadays, the Quran we have, whenever you pick it up, you need to remember Zayd ibn Thabit al-Ansari. He is involved in what we have today. He was the one. And this is why you hear the top reciters, Zayd ibn Thabit al-Ansari, Ubayy ibn Ka'b, Ali ibn Abi Talib. These were top readers from amongst the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, and they had memorized the Quran. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a good memory, and may He make us from those who can learn and understand. So he was the one, subhanallah, at the time of the companions, he was known as the one who had the most knowledge of the Quran or from amongst those who had the most. If you recall a few days ago, we spoke about a man known as Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu, also very young and he grew up. He was the cousin of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And what happened is one day Zayd ibn Thabit al-Ansari radiallahu anhu was coming out of his home and jumping onto his conveyance, his animal, 
And Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu assisted him and started holding the reins of the animal and helping him to go and to walk. So Zayd ibn Thabit says, Oh, relative of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Subhanallah, O oh, cousin of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, how can I allow this to happen to you? How can I allow you to do this to my animal? He says, you have taught me, you are one of those who've taught me. And this is how we have been taught to respect and to look after those who have taught us some knowledge. So Zayd ibn Thabit al-Ansari radiallahu anhu says, can I have a look at what's that on your hand? So he says, what is it? And he gave him his hand and that's when he kissed his hand. Subhanallah. And then Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu immediately said, what are you doing? He says, this is what I've been taught to do to the family of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You are a man, you are related so closely to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all the ability to respect those who have taught us. Also, he was one of those who had lots of knowledge regarding the laws of inheritance. So much so that there are certain rules and regulations governing the laws of inheritance. And the distribution of Zayd ibn Thabit al-Ansari is very well known. In fact, there are some of those rulings known as Zaydiyat al-Arba. The four major rulings of Zayd ibn Thabit al-Ansari radiallahu anh, this is in the laws of Fara'id or inheritance. May Allah make us from those who understand the laws of inheritance and apply them in a way that we earn paradise. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, whosoever applies the laws of inheritance that Allah has decreed shall earn paradise. The Quran makes mention of these verses. تِلْكَ حُدُودُ اللَّهِ وَمَنْ يُطِعِ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ يُدْخِلْهُ جَنَّاتِ These are the laws of Allah, speaking about the laws of inheritance. And whoever follows Allah and His Messenger, we will grant him paradise. And whoever discards and disregards the laws of inheritance, Allah says, they shall be doomed into hellfire. May that not happen to us. Brothers and sisters, one of the biggest tests we have in our lives is whether or not we adopt the laws of inheritance when we are about to die or when we, have, when we are writing our wills. May Allah make it easy for us and grant us paradise. So this man, subhanallah, he passed away at the time of Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan radiallahu anhu. And the day he passed away, Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu was amongst those who was crying. And he says, Wallahi, today with the burial of Zayd ibn Thabit, we have buried so much of the knowledge that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has given us. This was the man. He was the same man at the time of the death of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu. Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu called him to write the name of of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu an to take as khilafah or as a successor after the death of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu an. May Allah bless them all and grant us all some of the goodness and may Allah protect us all from evil. Ameen. Brothers and sisters, that was Zayd ibn Thabit al-Ansari radiallahu an and that was one of the great companions who was he just a young boy in Medina Munawwara when he accepted Islam upon the Hijrah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But this evening we are going to be speaking of the Lion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are going to be speaking of a man who was known as the leader of all the martyrs. Sayyidu shuhada Asadullahi wa Asadu Rasulihi. A man who was known as the Lion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Lion of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Who was this man? He was the uncle of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, yet he was similar in age. He was two years older than Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but he was a fierce man. He was feared and respected in Quraysh. Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib. Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib, the uncle of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was a very good looking man and he was well respected, well built. He was a person who used to love hunting so much that people used to know if you don't find Hamza, he's probably gone hunting. This was Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib and he was so closely related to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They used to respect each other. They played with each other as they grew up and he knew that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is a very noble and honored person. So much so at the age of 25, when Khadija bint Khawailid radiallahu anha proposed to marry Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, although he was much younger than her, Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib was the man who went with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to get him married. Subhanallah, that's how close they were. Although there was no Islam yet at the time, meaning Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was not yet a prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He was not granted the prophethood. But 
Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib was the one who was interested in him so much so that he also was by his side the day he got married to Khadija bint Khawailid radiallahu anha. So what happened is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam called his family members and told them about Islam. From amongst them was Abu Lahab and the others and we all have heard what Abu Lahab did. Abu Lahab said, Tabban laka ya Muhammad ali hadha jama'tana. Woe be upon you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Is this, is this why you've gathered us to tell us that you are a messenger? And this is when verses of Tabbat yada Abi Lahabin wa Tabba, the verses of Surah Al-Lahab were revealed. And Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib had not accepted Islam at that time, but he did not harm Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he knew that Muhammad is a respectful man, but he still did not accept the message. So Hamza was from amongst those who did not accept the message initially, but he'd never harmed Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because he knew the credentials of the individual. And he knew that I've been a friend with this man. He hasn't harmed anyone. He never lied. He's always trustworthy. One day when he was coming back from one of his hunting trips and he was a strong, well-built man, he had his bow and his arrow. It was on his back and he was walking very happily. They say when he used to walk, he had a bit of pride in his walk initially before accepting Islam. And people knew that is Hamza. You don't mess with this man. Subhanallah. So Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib was met on his way by a certain slave girl who used to belong to Abdullah ibn Jad'an. And she told him, do you know what happened to your nephew? Abu Jahl attacked him and abused him at Safa. And Abu Jahl has done this to him and that to him and embarrassed him in public. So he was abused and attacked. Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib knew that this is my friend, man. This is my man. He went up straight to Muhammad sallallahu and asked him, that did anyone see you when this happened? He said, everyone saw it, it happened in public. So he rushed to where Abu Jahl was and he was seated in the presence of so many people. And Abu Jahl was one of the leaders of Quraysh. He was much older than these people. And he was also related to them. And Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib beat him up so badly with his bow that he started bleeding on his head. And he said, Atashtumuhu wa ana ala dinihi aqulu ma yaqul. How can you abuse Muhammad sallallahu and attack him when I am one of his followers and I utter what he says? I bear witness there is none worthy of worship besides Allah and that Muhammad peace be upon him is definitely his messenger. They were shocked. They look at this man and they said, this is the most powerful so far of those who've accepted Islam. He was the most powerful, the most feared. Quraysh, they all happened to look at each other. And in a few moments, news spread across the whole of Quraysh that guess what happened? Hamza has just declared that he's one of the followers of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Subhanallah, this was something amazing. And look at how his anger had made him declare his acceptance of Islam. And he wanted to defend Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And the degree to which he wanted to defend him, he said, I am his follower. Amazing. Subhanallah. So the kuffar of Quraysh were quite shocked. The Muslimin were very happy. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam was so happy with this news that he made a dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib. He was one of those whom a few days later, Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu accepted Islam at the house of Al-Arqam ibn Abi Al-Arqam. And Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib used to stand at the door. Why did he used to stand at the door? Because the kuffar of Quraysh now found out that they are all gathering at the house of Al-Arqam. It was more or less a secret hideout, but they got to know it. And when Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib accepted Islam, he used to stand at the door to ensure that no one who wants to harm us must come across here. No one can cross this line. It's over. But when Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu came, Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib made his famous statement saying, إِنْ يُرِدِ اللَّهُ بِهِ خَيْرًا يُسْلِمْ وَإِنْ يَكُنْ غَيْرَ ذَلِكَ يَكُنْ قَتْلُهُ عَلَيْنَا هَيِّنَا Asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if this man, if goodness is intended from him, and if he intends goodness, let him accept Islam. And if he intends anything else, make it easy for us to overpower him, overcome him. And Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib witnessed Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu entering the fold of Islam. That was the next most powerful man. And at that stage, 40 men had accepted Islam. And this is when Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu together with Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib radiallahu anhu, they got up and they took the Muslims in public to the Kaaba in order to engage in tawaf and salah. 
and they made two rows of people at the head of one was Umar ibn al-Khattab and the head of the other was Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib. May Allah's peace be upon all of them. And the kuffar of Quraysh were just looking. They were just watching. And they said, now this has come a force to reckon with. This has become a force to reckon with. Subhanallah. And they were shocked and surprised. This Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib was from amongst those whom when he made the hijra to Medina Munawwara, he too got up near the Kaaba and told Quraysh, I am going out. You dare try to harm me. Because they used to follow those who were going for hijra and harm them on the path and try and waylay them and so on. And Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib was one of them. Just like Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu did and Talha ibn Ubaidillah. They had got up and they said, we are leaving for hijrah. Anyone want to try anything here? Be careful. Subhanallah. This was Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib. So he was related in a unique way to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Something we did not mention at the beginning. He was a brother of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam known as a foster brother, which means they breastfed from the same woman. And she was Thuwaybah, the slave girl of Abu Lahab himself. When they were little, she had breastfed Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam and just before that she had breastfed Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib. So according to the Islamic rulings, they were considered brothers, foster brothers who were suckled by the same woman, subhanallah. So this was another relationship that they had. Now on the time of the battle of Badr, he got out with the Muslims and they had to go in order to get back what was usurped from them. The kuffar of Quraysh had usurped a lot from them. So Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib, he was known as a person who used to have a red feather, a feather of an ostrich. It is reported that a feather of an ostrich on his chest when he wore his armor in the battle of Badr. And that was supposed to be a sign of bravery. Telling the kuffar of Quraysh, you want to harm? Come, come and try it with me. Let's see what happens. This was the sign. So Hamza was the bravest of the lot. He was known as Asadullah wa Asadu Rasulihi. He was known as the lion of Allah and the lion of the messenger because he was always at the defense and he was always there if anyone tried to mess. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a little bit of bravery. I mean, so subhanallah, the battle of Badr, we find one of the leaders of, the, of Quraysh, he got out. And they were half drunk because they'd be drinking the previous night. They were so excited. We are so many in number. And these Muslims are only 300 odd, 313 approximately. They don't even have proper weaponry. We're going to be winning. So they drank all night when they got up half drunk in the morning and the battle was about to take place. You find Utbah ibn Rabi'a. He got out and he says, who is going to come out from amongst you to engage in a duet? Duet meaning when the two begin to start the war with the sword fight. So three of them got out from amongst Quraysh. Utbah ibn Rabi'ah, Shayba ibn Rabi'ah, and Al-Walid ibn Utbah. So two brothers and the son of Utbah. And they called out, who is coming from you to attack us? Let's see what happens. We are calling for a duet, three from amongst you. So immediately some young boys from the Ansar, they rushed out. So Utbah looks at them and says, who are you? They said, we are men from the Ansar. He said, no, go back. We don't want you. We want the leaders. We want the big men. We want, we don't want people we don't know. Go back. Meaning, you know, you guys, what do you know about war here? So what happened is, Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu came out. Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib came out. Subhanallah. And Ubaid ibn al-Harith radiallahu anhu came out, the three of them. And they happened to be three duets at the same time concurrently and the three from amongst Quraysh were immediately dealt with and subhanallah Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib was victorious Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu was victorious and as for Ubaidah ibn al-Harith or Ubaid ibn al-Harith radiallahu anhu he was also victorious but later on he succumbed to his wounds and he was martyred later on however after that, the battle had started and it was a hot battle, meaning the heat of the battle was such. It was fierce and ferocious. My brothers and sisters, it ended with the defeat in no time of the kuffar of Quraysh. Those who had usurped the wealth of the Muslimin and stolen their wealth. And a lot of their leaders lost their lives in that particular battle. And so what happened is after that battle, Quraysh was counting the damage and they were counting their losses. And from amongst that, they noticed that Hamza 
was one of the strongest of the lot. So they decided that you know what? The next war that takes place, we will make sure that we mark Hamza himself. He needs to go. If he is there, they're going to win all the time. So what did they do in the battle of Uhud? The daughter of Utbah, her name was Hind binti Utbah. She was the wife of Abu Sufyan. She had a slave. His name was Wahshi. Wahshi was a man from Africa. They called him in. They spoke to him. He was known as a very good archer and he could throw spears and he could aim and he never would miss his target. So they called him in. They said, if you get Hamza with one throw, we will free you. Now he didn't want to engage in any killing or fighting, but he wanted his own freedom. So they took him in the battle of Uhud. And it did happen that when they watched Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib radiallahu an in that battle of Uhud once again, and the Muslimin were doing so well, Wahshi says, I looked at Hamza and I knew that I don't want to kill this man. His face was glowing. He was looking so blessed. But he says, I wanted my freedom on one hand and I was not a believer. I hardly knew what Muhammad was calling towards. And he says, I threw that spear of mine and Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib was martyred. And Wahshi says, from that minute as I was free, as in a free man, no longer a slave, but I was made captive of the devil from that particular moment. I could not sleep and I did not sleep for years after that. He says something kept bringing back this image to me. My brothers and sisters to this day, those who engage in warfare against the innocent, believe me, they cannot sleep. They suffer mental disorders. They suffer problems. This goes back to the time we look at what happened to Wahshi. He suffered a mental disorder which prohibited him from sleeping, which prohibited him from thinking. He says, I became a drunkard and my life was totally wasted. He accepted Islam after Ta'if. He accepted Islam at a later stage. And yes, we call him Wahshi radiyallahu an, whether we like it or not. The same applies to Hind binti Utbah radiyallahu anha. As much as she was involved in so much on the day of Uhud, we call her radiyallahu anha, whether we like it or not. She accepted Islam at the victory of Mecca. Even Abu Sufyan, we call him radiyallahu an, whether we like it or not. These were people, only Allah knows what happened, why it happened. Yet they were to accept Islam later on. And the Prophet sallallahu says, whatever they did in the past is completely deleted. Subhanallah. So Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib was martyred. Here comes Hind binti Utbah. She decides to put in a knife into his chest and slice it and take his liver out. And she started chewing it because she thought perhaps this man who was responsible for the death of my, my, my father and my brother and my uncle and my relatives in the battle of Badr. Perhaps I will achieve coolness of my heart if I were to chew his liver. But sadly, sadly, very sadly, she did not achieve that coolness because what she did was something terrible. When Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saw after the battle of Uhud, the martyrs from amongst them was Musab ibn Umair radiallahu an. And then he saw Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib. He began to cry. And when he saw what had happened with his chest, he wept so profusely sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he was so angry. He says, Wallahi, what they have done is absolutely wrong. My brothers and sisters in Islam, we are not allowed to harm people to that degree whereby we go and slice their bodies and so on so much so that a post-mortem if it can be avoided should be avoided because it is wrong for us to cut up a body after the death of a person yes if there is a case where the police are involved and there is something where the law of the land makes it necessary then obviously we have no option but when it comes to where we know what has happened and so on and the law allows you to bypass that then Islam would teach us to bypass it because it is wrong to cut up a body after a person has passed away. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all goodness. And this is the same whether the person is a Muslim or not a Muslim. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us an understanding. So the Prophet ﷺ was so upset that he said, Wallahi, I am going to seek revenge by executing 70 of those people. Now, obviously, this was a statement that he uttered because he was so passionate and emotional. But immediately Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed verses.
Beautiful verses. Allah says, when you seek retribution, do not seek more than what had happened to you. If I want to revenge someone who slapped me, I can slap him back. But I cannot shoot someone who just gave me a slap. Subhanallah. If you understand, you cannot penalize a person more than they deserve. And this is the general ruling in Islam. But Allah says, if you are patient, it is better for you. Learn to forgive. Subhanallah. Learn to forgive. Look, the patience of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Those who killed Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib, they all accepted Islam sometime later. Subhanallah. Look at this. Have you thought of it? So as passionate as he was, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he broke that promise of his. He promised that he would revenge. He broke the promise and he gave what was known as a compensation of having made a promise. And on top of that, what did he do? Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was kind to those who were captive on the day of Badr. So kind that he freed a lot of them. But when it came to the people of the battle of Uhud, where Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib was martyred, subhanallah, the loss was so much. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he went to bury his own uncle, wallahi, he cried. The sister of Hamza, her name was Safiya binti Abdul Muttalib. She said, I want to go and see my brother. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told her son. Her son was a Zubair ibn al-Awwam, radiyallahu anhum jami'an. He's Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, don't let her go there. If she sees him, she is going to struggle to come to terms with it. And from this we learn that when a person has died in a car accident or in a condition that was not good and their body has been, you know, maimed or it, it is no, it is deformed after they've died. It is better for the close family members, especially the females, not to see the face when it is so, you know, damaged because it is better for you to remember the person with the face that they had in the peak of their lives than for you to remember the last image that might not be good. But Safiya binti Abdul Muttalib, she said, Oh messenger, I am strong. I need to go. I need to see him. So she went, she was given the permission. She saw him and she gave two pieces of cloth to, be, to enshroud him. But one of the people who was right next to him from amongst the Ansar was killed in a similar way. And the same thing had happened to him. And he was also slit in the middle. And what they did is they used one of the cloths for him and the other one they used for Hamza. But they found when they covered his head, his feet was showing the same as Musa ibn Umair radiallahu anhum. So the Prophet sallallahu covered his feet with a branch, a green branch, and then they buried him. And Muhammad sallallahu was so sad on that day. He cried. It is reported that when he did the takbir of salah of janazah upon Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib, he did more than the usual amount of takbirat. So he said Allahu Akbar several more times. Some narrations say up to seven times. And one or two of the historians say that it went up to 70 times. He carried on Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. However, we don't know the exact narration, but what we do know is it was more than the usual amount. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless them all. This was the man. What a powerful man. Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib. He was martyred in the battle of Uhud. And as I said, he was known as Asadullah. He was also known as Sayyidu Shuhada. So he was known as the, the lion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And at the same time, he was also known as the leader of all the martyrs. My brothers and sisters, we ask Allah to bless them all. When you visit al Madinah al-Munawwara, it is important that if we were to go to Uhud, we should make mention of Hamza by name, radiallahu an. Musab ibn Umayr radiallahu an by name. Assalamu alayka ya Hamza, ya Sayyid al-Shuhada. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant them all peace and grant us all peace. Those are the ones who struggled so that the deen has got to us today. Those are the ones who gave their lives so that the deen has got to us today. Yet we have become so weak that we do not get up for Salatul Fajr and we do not give up a sin that we are committing. And others have given their lives for us to enjoy the fruit. We should be ashamed of ourselves. My brothers and sisters, it's about time we promised Allah that the minimum is we became strong on that which Allah has obligated upon us. And we became strong to abandon that which will displease Allah in terms of sin. May Allah help us to eradicate the sins that we are engaged in. 
and may he help us to become strong upon the obligations that he has made upon us especially when it comes to the five daily prayer no compromise may allah strengthen us wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabiyyina muhammad subhanallahi wa bihamdihi subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika nashhadu an la ilaha illa ant nastaghfiruka